Hello everybody, this is Dan Trotter, Pretty Good Bible Studies. The video that we're going to do now is called Participatory Believers Meetings, Interactive Meetings in the New Testament Home Church. This video is a part of a longer playlist of videos concerning the New Testament House Church, how to do church according to apostolic patterns, apostolic traditions. If you're interested, you can look this uh, playlist up on YouTube and check out some more stuff about the New Testament House Church. I hope you enjoy this particular video. All right, let's get started. Participatory Believers Meetings. We'll give you a brief introduction, then we're going to talk about ministry of the many as opposed to ministry of the one guy up at the front, the pastor, the one-man show, the traditional church way of doing it. We're going to talk about the benefits of doing uh, mutually participatory meetings. We're going to talk about misunderstandings that can arise when, a, uh, when one tries to interpret the scriptures concerning mutually participatory meetings. Then we're going to talk about practical problems that might arise when you have an open meeting problems that will not arise when you have a closed uh, American type church meeting when you have one man at the front and everybody else silent. All right, so let's look at our introduction here. Part A of the introduction is going to be the purpose of a meeting. If you ask uh, the average Christian what the purpose of a New Testament church meeting, you will not get a unified answer. Most people don't know scripturally. B, we'll talk about interactive and mutually participatory. What does that mean? And then we'll summarize this introduction by in part C, by talking about in the New Testament church and the traditional church disconnect, how different the two churches are. I've often said that if the Apostle Paul came back today, he would look at the New Testament church and wonder what religion he's in. It's so different than the one, the religion that he started. All right, let's look at A, the purpose of a meeting. The scripture clearly tells us what the purpose of a meeting is. 1 Corinthians 14, 3. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and in consolation. Upbuilding is the purpose. 1 Corinthians 14, 12. So with yourselves, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. Edification, some translations use. 1 Corinthians 14, 26, and this is the key verse here, really. Let all things in the church meeting be done for building up. Let all things, the context is in the church meeting. Let all things be done for building up, for edification. So everything you do when you go to church is to build up your brother and sister. That's what, that's what the purpose is. Now, if you're a charismatic, you go to church, you're looking for a good worship service. If you're a reformed guy, oh, you're looking for great theology, good teaching. If you're a seeker-sensitive type, you're looking for evangelism going on to get the lost. All of those are wonderful things, but it's not the purpose of the New Testament church meeting. The New Testament church meeting was to be done for edification, for building up. Now let's look at another verse that shows this, Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. That's why we go to church, to encourage one another, to stimulate one another to love and good works, because folks... Love and good works is not a natural condition of our flesh. Even after we're born again, we need to be stirred up to love and good works. It doesn't happen naturally. Not neglecting to meet together. Why do we meet together? So we can stir up one another, as is the habit of some. If you don't meet together, you're not going to be able to stir up one another. But encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. We meet together to encourage one another. So that's the purpose of a meeting, edification, building up one another. Part B of our introduction, what is an interactive and mutually participatory meeting? Well, first of all, let me emphasize this by the falling letters here. There was no one leader leading the meeting. That's the main thing is you don't have one guy talking all the time and everybody else being quiet. And, of course, that's the way the traditional American church service is done today. And it's not scriptural. And it's not right. Instead of the one-man ministry, we should consider uh, some slogans here which emphasize the New Testament way of doing the, new new, the church meeting. Ministry of the many. Not ministry of the one guy at the front with the big mouth and the little ears in the back, just listening, 
passively like pew potatoes. No, ministry of the many. Everybody should minister, not just the one guy at the front. The New Testament church was not a one-man show. Every member a minister. That's what we should strive for. We should go from me to we. I got that from a traditional church pastor, actually, who decided he was being worn out by trying to do everything. And so he said, you know, instead of talking about me doing everything, let's talk about we doing everything, which is getting toward the New Testament ideal. The priesthood of all believers is a slogan that we all know as Protestants, but how many of us as Protestants practice that? Every Sunday we give a lie to our own beliefs. We say, we're all priests, but then we sit there like mute potatoes listening to a sermon. Part C, interactive and mutually participatory. How can we know that? Well, let's consider the each verses in the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 12, 7, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To each. It doesn't say to the pastor is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. 1 Corinthians 12, 11. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. This verse does not say... Everybody's empowered by the same Spirit who apportions to the pastor in the, uh, as he wills. It doesn't say that. 1 Corinthians 14, 26a. What then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Each one. All of us. From the top to the bottom, from the left to the right. Not just the one guy at the front. Let's go to part C, and I'm going to give you a summary here in, a, in tabular form showing the disconnect between the New Testament church and the traditional church. All right, on the left column, I've got traditional church. On the right column, I've got New Testament church. The traditional church has one man in charge. The New Testament church has no one man in charge. You walk into a New Testament church meeting, you should not be able to tell who the leaders are. We used to say that when we do house church. It's amazing. You walk in here, you don't really know who the leaders are. Now, I'm not saying that leaders aren't important. Your church will die without leaders. You've got to have leaders. But in a typical meeting, if everything's working smoothly, there's no problems, you're not going to see the guy in charge. The guy in charge, the elders show up when there's problems, when something needs to be done. But when the church is moving smoothly, you can't tell who's in charge. In the traditional church, the sermon dominates. In the New Testament church, no one gift dominates. In the traditional church, music is a show, a performance. In the New Testament church, songs are sung to one another. And let me tell you something, you can't, sing songs to one another when you've got music so loud that you can't hear yourself think and you can't hear yourself sing. There is no congregational singing. It is a travesty what is being done in modern churches today, a disaster. In the traditional church, there are worship leaders to lead us into singing. In the New Testament church, there were no worship leaders. The believers sang songs to themselves, one to another. In the traditional church, you have mega meeting sizes. Now, if you have a, si a meeting that large, of course you're not going to have mutual participatory meetings because it's impossible. Too many people, not enough time for each person to, to, to share their gift. But in the New Testament church, you have small meetings, and the small meetings make interactive meetings possible. In the traditional church, you have one or two people that minister, one pastor, sometimes two pastors, maybe a worship leader and the pastor. But you don't have many people ministering, but in the New Testament church, each one ministers. Everyone has a psalm, a tongue, an interpretation, a prophecy, a, a healing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In the traditional church, smells and bells aid the worship. That's if you're liturgical. If you're not liturgical, you just have bright, flashing PowerPoints, maybe some smoke, maybe some carbon dioxide smoke floating through the air to give you this numinous feeling of awe. Or maybe you're going to have to have loud music. Whatever. you got to have all that stuff to make worship go. In the New Testament church, it was worship in the Holy Spirit, not based on emotion. It's really funny. When I was used to be in the charismatic movement and go into charismatic churches, I used to always hear anti-charismatics say, charismatics and Pentecostals, the worship is based on emotion, not on the Spirit. And now you go to non-charismatic churches, and sure enough, you got a bunch of young people jumping around, clapping their hands with the loud music, the rock music, worship based on emotion, not upon the spirit. I guess what goes around comes around. All right, let me uh, give you a little satire here written by a friend of mine in Atlanta, Rusty Intrican. He uh, has written a parody uh, of 
1 Corinthians 12 and 14, and it illustrates perfectly the difference between the way it ought to be done and the way we're doing it today in America. The modern way of meeting. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, the pastor hath a doctrine, and the minister of music hath psalms? Let all things be done unto worship. If anyone besides the pastor hath the doctrine, let him not speak. Let him hold his peace. Let him sit in the pew and face the back of the neck of the person which sitteth ahead of him. Let the people keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted upon, unto them to speak. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith church tradition. But if they will learn anything, let them ask their pastor after the service, for it is a shame for a layman to speak in the church. For the pastor, he hath a seminary degree, and the layman, he hath not so lofty a degree. If any man desire to remain a church member in good standing, let him acknowledge that what I write to you is the command of the denominational headquarters. But if any man ignore this, he shall be promptly escorted out the door by the ushers. Wherefore, brothers, covet not to speak in the church. Let all things be done decently and in the order in which it hath been written in the church bulletin. All right, let's move on now to the second part of our video. Second part of our PowerPoint, I'm sorry. Ministry of the many. That's what we're aiming at here, to have participatory meetings. Now, I'm going to divide this section into two subsections. Subsection A, no one man show. I'm going to go through the scriptures and point out basically negative things, what there is not in the scriptures. So it's going to be sort of ne what's not there. And then we go to part B, what is there uh, that shows how meetings were done in the New Testament. So let's start with part A. There was no one man show. First, the, the first thing that did not exist in the New Testament was sermons. They did not exist in the New Testament church meeting. And sermons, we think of sermons as that's just part of the woodwork. Of course we have sermons. No, we don't have sermons in the Bible. They're not there. They come from Greek rhetoric. The three-point sermon, you know, the, the Greek orator, he walks through the uh, house and he, has, he goes to the left room and he describes what's in the left room and the right room to kind of keep him in track, to organize his, his, his speech. A well, sermon is kind of like a Christian speech. The three points, the alliteration, the three points that alliterate. I think that comes from Greek rhetoric too. I can't remember. I wouldn't be surprised. But all this fancy rhetorical stuff that is not in the Bible. Now you say, yeah, well, there was a sermon, Sermon on the Mount. That was Jesus teaching. And it was not a rhetorical oration. It was just Jesus speaking. And he did a wonderful job. And besides, I like to say, okay, fine. You find somebody that can, pre that can give me a sermon like Jesus gives me a sermon, I'll listen to it. That Sermon on the Mount, by the way, that's not a scriptural term. That's the heading in, the, in your Bible, Sermon on the Mount. It was a teaching on the Mount. Uh, even Paul's teaching was not a sermon. <clears throat> Let's look at Acts 20, verse 7. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them. Now that word preach has got to be the most confused word that's used in the Bible. It can, Sometimes the English word preach translates evangelize. Sometimes it translates teaching. Sometimes it translates exhortation. I've decided to never use the word preach again if I can help it because it's so confusing and so imprecise in English. The Greek word for preached is dialego, dialegomia, dialegomia, dialegomia. I probably got the accent on the wrong syllable. The English word dialogue comes from this. You can recognize it. And the definition of this word is consider and discuss, argue. So when Paul was so-called preaching unto them, as the King James has it, what he was doing is he was considering doctrine with the, with the Christians at Troas. He was discussing things with them, and he might have even been arguing with them. Who knows? Uh, but that's the kind of talking that ought to go on in church, not a Greek sermon. Second thing that did not exist in the New Testament church, pulpits. Pulpits did not exist in the New Testament church meeting. They were first used in churches about 250 A.D. Uh, they came from the Greek ambo, which was a pulpit used by Greeks, Jews and Greeks for monologues. Monologues. We don't have monologues in the New Testament, so we don't need a pulpit. Uh, if you want a great book to show you where all this stuff comes from, how it got imported from pagan culture into the church and how we think it's so Christian when it's actually just traditional and many times pagan, um, 
I would suggest to you Frank Viola's book, Pagan Christianity. Frank Viola, and it was co-written by the famous Christian pollster whose name slips my mind right now, but uh, Frank Viola's book, Pagan Christianity, he goes through all of the stuff. It's fascinating reading the stuff that we've imported into the church that really ought not to be there. Another thing that did not exist in the early New Testament church, chairs were probably not put out in rows in the New Testament church meeting. How can we know this? Well, James 2, 3, part B to James 2, 4, part A. If you say to the poor man, you stand over here or sit down by my footstool, and I emphasize footstool, have you not made distinctions among yourselves? Now, what's footstool? I think in the Greek, I don't have the Greek word here, but it's hupo. I forgot the Greek word, but it's under the foot, literally, under the foot, footstool. A footstool is household furniture. It is not something that you stick in the middle of a, a, row, a bunch of row of chairs. So you see the New Testament church meeting was in a home. They were gathered around. They were not necessarily lined up in chairs, all right? Probably, I'm not going to, I wouldn't make, I wouldn't say definitely, but I would say probably you didn't have chairs lined up in a row in general based upon that particular verse. Now, another thing that did not exist in the New Testament church is worship performances. They did not exist in the New Testament church. What did, now I'm going to give you a list of what did not exist in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14. Worship leaders. Worship teams, ear-splitting amplification, canned choices of music with no believer input, choirs, carbon dioxide smoke, all of which, as you know, is, is traditional staple for uh, American so-called worship. And I do mean so-called. It's not worship. It's a show. It's a performance. What did exist in Ephesians 5.19? Let me tell you what did exist. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. How can you sing and make melody in the, the, to the Lord in your heart and address one another when you can't even hear each other speak? How can you do that if you have one worship leader telling you what to sing, when to sing, and in which order to sing? I'll leave that to you as food for thought. Now let's go to the second part of this second section here, uh, scriptural proof uh, to show you that um, New Testament meetings were indeed participatory and not uh, and interactive and not uh, controlled by one person. 1 Corinthians 12, 4, Paul says this to the Corinthians. Now there are varieties of gifts, varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. When you have one sermon being preached and one uh, worship service being done that's two that's not a variety first corinthians 12 8 through 10 4 to 1 is given through the spirit the utterance of wisdom word of wisdom and to another the utterance of knowledge word of knowledge according to the same spirit to another faith by the same spirit to another gifts of healing by the one spirit to another the working of miracles to another prophecy to another the ability to distinguish between spirits to another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. Look at all the different gifts. Now, I will point out, most of these gifts are charismatic gifts, and if you're a cessationist, you're going to have a hard time <laughs> divvying up the ministries and to have an interactive meeting. But I will say this, it is possible. You've got different people sharing the Scriptures. You can have different teachings. It doesn't have to be one person teaching every week. Or it could just be a, a brief scriptural testimony and, and so forth, a word of encouragement to somebody. Or somebody could lead in a prayer, but it is hard. I mean, the the the, the I'm going to do a, a playlist on charismata, uh, in which I will emphasize the uh, and 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 discuss all these charismatic gifts. But I think if you're really going to do the New Testament church right, you're going to need the charismatic gifts. But even if you don't have those, and, and I'll tell you, most charismatic churches don't have these gifts because they got one man in the front doing all the teaching. Uh, so anyway, you see here, the, for the Corinthians is the only place in the Scriptures where we have a, a peek into what it was like to go to a New Testament church meeting. And it is so totally different than what we do that it should at least cause you to think. It should slap you in the face. It should bring you up. It should focus your attention. You should think, 
why are we doing it so much differently? There's something wrong. 1 Corinthians 14, 26a. What then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. So you see very clearly the meetings were participatory. I don't think anybody disagrees with that. What Typically what people do, though, they say, well, that was for back then. What's good for the New Testament church is good for the New Testament church. But what's good for us is good for us. It kind of sounds postmodern, doesn't it? All right, now let's look at the benefits of participatory meetings. And I think what I'm going to do is hold that until we get to the next video. And I will just close this video down here. I hope you will enjoy it. Next video, we'll talk, uh, talk about the uh, benefits of uh, participatory meetings, misunderstandings, and practical problems. See you then.